Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. Hello, hello. Can you all hear me today? This is Father Adam. We had some uh, difficulties today, so I'm coming to you like this. So wonderful. Uh, say hello if you can hear me. Hello, hello. I know that uh, many of you were waiting for the Mass in, uh, in English, but we had some difficulties in uh, uh, being able to broadcast it. So um, I decided to come to you live this way and to give you a good reflection in English. Hello, hello, say hello. The first reading for this Sunday from the Acts of the Apostles. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet, paid him homage. Peter, however, raised him up saying, get up, I myself am also a human being. Then Peter proceeded to speak and said, in truth, I see that God shows no partiality. Rather, in every nation, whoever fears him and acts uprightly is acceptable to him. While Peter was still speaking these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the word. The circumcised believers who had accompanied Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit should have been poured out on the Gentiles also, so they could hear them speaking in tongues and glorifying God. Then Peter responded, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit even as we have? He ordered them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. The second reading, Beloved, from the first letter of John, let us love one another because love is of God. Everyone who loves is begotten by God and knows God. Whoever is without love does not know God, for God is love. In this way, the love of God was revealed to us. God sent his only son into the world so that we might have life through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as expiation for our sins. The gospel is from John chapter 15. And listen to these beautiful words of Jesus to us for this Sunday. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No greater love than this possesses a human being than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you slaves any longer because the slave does not know what the master is doing, but I call you friends because I've made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. What a beautiful word this Sunday. You know, a couple days ago, I posted a picture of Angel, the young man, the 14-year-old young man who 
killed himself, who committed suicide a couple years ago. And I told the story of St. Teresa of Avila experiencing suicide in her own family, where her own brother committed suicide, jumping from a bridge and drowning in a river. And Teresa of Avila had these great visions of Jesus. And she was greatly afflicted. She experienced great pain in her own life because she also wanted to know, like so many people want to know, where are my relatives who may not have led exemplary lives? Did they go to hell? Are they in purgatory? What happened to them? All of you many times wonder the same things. That's why you come and you say, Father, pray for, uh, pray for my family member. Pray for this, especially when we are so surrounded by so many people taking their own lives. And Teresa of Avila was also afflicted with these thoughts as well. They were bothering her. Where is my brother? And she asked Jesus, Jesus, what happened to my brother who committed suicide? Where is he? And Jesus responded to Teresa and said, Teresa, Teresa, between the bridge where your brother jumped off of and the water where he drowned was my mercy. Mercy found Teresa's brother and I said this story and I told of my great certitude that I was certain that angel went to heaven and is with God. A 14 year old boy who committed suicide and then all of these harsh, religious, rigid people started commenting how can you be sure of that? Basically sending the young boy to hell. Well, if you believe in a God who would send a mentally distressed, depressed young man to hell, you can have this God. I don't want him. My God, my God is love. I do not want a harsh, a rigid, a judgmental God. I want a God who is love, and I invite you to want that God as well. The reason why so many people do not believe in a God who is love, a God who is pure forgiveness and pure mercy, is because we do not treat one another with that same forgiveness and mercy. That's why we believe in a harsh God in a God who sends people to hell. God does not send anybody to hell. Hell in the Bible is a garbage dump and you can experience hell right here. That young man experienced hell in his own depression that led him to commit suicide right here in this life. God does not want anybody in hell. God is the God who is the woman in the Bible who cleans the whole house looking for the one lost coin because she is missing one and she wants to have 10 because 10 in the Bible is a number of completeness. It's a complete number. God is incomplete without any of his children. God wants all of his children to be with him and God does not rest until he has all of his children with him. You know, when the people of Israel were led out by Moses out of Egypt, and the Egyptians, their oppressors, we are told in the Bible, drowned in the Red Sea. When Moses parted the Red Sea, we are told in the Talmud, which is the holy book of the Jewish people, which explains the Jewish faith, and we are Jews, we are Christians, but our faith is Jewish. We are baptized Jews. Jesus was Jewish. And we are told that God is in heaven and all the angels are partying. Everybody is having a great time in heaven because the Israelites were freed from Egypt, freed from slavery. And God is all sad in a corner 
and God is crying, God is weeping, the Talmud tells us, which is the holiest of the books of the Jewish faith, explaining the Jewish faith. God is all sad in a corner, and one angel asks him, why are you all sad? Why aren't you celebrating, God? Aren't you happy that your children were freed? And God says, how can I be happy? How can I celebrate when my children drowned in the Red Sea? God was sad because he did not have all of his children with him. That is the God that I believe in. The God who finds us. Did you hear in the gospel today? Jesus says, it is not you who have chosen me, Jesus says, but it is I who have chosen you. It's God who finds us, not we who find God. Did Mary look for God? No, God found her. Did she ask to be the mother of Jesus? No, God found her. Did Paul, the great apostle, did he look for God? No, it's God who went after him. Did Peter or all the other apostles, did they go after God? No, God went after them as God is after you. And God is after each and every one of your children, your grandchildren, your family members. The more we are away from God, the more God is after us. The more distressed we are, the more God is for us. The more he is after us. That is the God that I believe in. Not the God who would send somebody to hell. To hell with that God. Who wants a God like that? If you believe in a God like that, you can have him. I don't want him. God does not punish anybody. God does not punish anybody. Let me tell you that one more time. God does not punish anybody. There's enough punishment that we receive from the evil and bad people all around us who curse us. God blesses us. I had to take that post down. I had to take it down because I was so worried about the parents and the family members of this young man. I couldn't risk them reading some of these awful messages of people sending their son to hell. Religious people. Be careful with the religious people, you know. Be careful with them. You know, in the, in the book of Acts, which we read today, we are told that God shows no partiality. In the early church, they had great debates about who could be in and who could be out. You know, uh, because, of course, in the early church, they were Jewish and uh, they, they thought that you had to become Jewish first in order to be baptized. Well, it's not that easy if you're an adult to become Jewish first, especially if you're a man, because you'd have to get circumcised. Uh, that's a very painful process, you know, especially if you're an adult. They did not have uh, anesthesia back then or pain medicine or they didn't know things about germs and disinfectants and things like that. So uh, they had great debates. Who could we let in? Because Jews had to keep dietary laws and, and the Sabbath and all of that. So the great debate in the book of Acts is... Do these people, the Gentiles, the ones who are not Jewish, do they first have to become Jewish in order to become Christians, in order to become followers of Jesus, in order to join the church? And Peter has a vision. And in the vision, he sees all of these people eating pork. Can you imagine this? I mean, it's like, uh, you coming to Mass and instead of bread and wine, seeing pork chops and whiskey, okay? I mean, you get the picture, the shocker for Peter, and he is told in the vision to let everybody in to the church because the church is for everybody. It's not an exclusive club. And that's when they begin to baptize every single person, the Gentiles, everybody is let in. 
You see, we have to go from being believers to being belongers. That's what we need. We all want to belong, don't we? Why is there so much suffering right now? Because people want to belong. We want to belong. You know, let me tell you um, this story of the couple. Every single day they are having uh, breakfast. They're having breakfast. And um, they're looking out the window. And the husband says to his wife, he says, Honey, look at the... Look at the laundry of the neighbors. They need to get a new washing machine. Their laundry is so dirty. They need to get a new detergent. What's wrong with them? Look at that, how dirty their laundry is. Look out the window and look at that. And every single day, the same thing. The husband looks out the window and he sees the dirty laundry of the neighbors. And then... One day they're eating breakfast and he looks out the window and he says, Honey, look, they must have gotten a new washing machine. The neighbors must have gotten a new washing machine. Their laundry is clean. And the wife looks at the husband and says, No, 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 I cleaned the windows. That's how it is. As Jesus says, we notice everything wrong with our neighbors. We notice the big, the big thing that, are, that is in the eye of our neighbor, but we don't notice the big beam in our own eye. That's how we are. Clean your own window. In the, uh, in the book of Acts, in chapter 8, uh, we have the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch uh, is later baptized by Philip. And you know that my name is Adam Philip. Did you know that? It's not just Adam, but it's also uh, Philip. Adam Philip Kotas. And the Ethiopian eunuch... Uh, in the book, in the it's chapter eight of the book of Acts, uh, is a God fearer, uh, a foreigner who worships anonymously the God of Israel. Now, this was quite common in the ancient world, as there was a pantheon of gods that the Romans worshipped. You know, the Roman gods or the Greek gods, and these gods that these people in the ancient world worshipped didn't give a rat's behind about the people who worshipped them. They didn't care about them. And so the God of Israel was extremely popular. And so this eunuch and eunuchs were uh, men who had been castrated. Uh, he, Philip figures, is a worshipper of the God of Israel in secret. He is a uh, a person who worships the God of Israel in secret. Scores of people worshipped the God of Israel in secret because the God of Israel was a moral God who is all good and who is love, as the second reading for this Sunday tells us. God is love, and it's a God that wants to help you. You're not a God that you need to fear. The fear of God, you know, when you talk about the fear of God, it just means you live in the presence of God, that you are aware always that God is with you, that you are never alone. It doesn't mean that you're scared of God. We, have, we never should be ever scared of God, ever. There's nothing to be scared of. God loves you, God is with you, and God is helping you. You should never, ever be afraid of God. Fear of God just means that you're in God's presence all the time that you are never outside of his presence. And many Gentiles wanted to join the Jewish faith, but they couldn't 
because they would have to abide by all the dietary laws that I told you about. You know, like you couldn't eat this, you couldn't eat that, you couldn't eat this, clothing laws, Sabbath laws. And for men, as I just told you, it was very complicated because you'd have to get uh, circumcised. Do you know what that is? Or do I have to tell you? Okay. It's a very painful procedure, especially if you're uh, an adult. Ouch. Hurts. Okay. I can't even imagine. <laughs> so people couldn't join. They were prevented from worshiping out openly joining the, the, the people of Israel. You know, they were, they were on the sidelines, and yet they loved the God of Israel, who is the God of Jesus. So Philip, in chapter 8, notices this uh, eunuch, again, this castrated man. He notices, the Bible tells us, that he has a pitched voice, he has a smooth skin, He's effeminate, of course. He is effeminate. Ah, oh, ouch, right? Ouch, you know? Oh, my God. Yeah. And in the ancient world, eunuchs were not considered men, you know, or women. They were like a third gender. They were viewed by many as monstrosities. They were excluded from many circles, especially religious circles. The Old Testament excludes them. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1, we read, No one who has been castrated can enter the assembly of the Lord. Banned! There you go. The Bible bans eunuchs from being included. They cannot, they cannot join the church. Boom! Huh? Isn't that sometimes how it is today? You know, these people cannot be included, right? You know, gay people can't be included in the church, we are told so many times, right? Okay. The, the Bible says so, we are told. You know, uh, the divorced, oh no. Oh no, 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 no. Divorced people, no way, okay? No way. I mean... These people can't be included. These people can't be included. You have to be a certain way. Deuteronomy 23.1 bans eunuchs from being included. But the eunuch hears about Jesus, the despised one who, who was beaten and rejected even though he embodied the love of God. And what does the eunuch want? The eunuch wants to be baptized. So should Philip do it or not? Should Philip baptize him? Clearly, remember the Bible, the New Testament did not exist at that time. It was only the Old Testament. And Philip knows that Jewish scripture and Jewish law bans eunuchs from being baptized. He's not supposed to do it. But the eunuch wants to be baptized. So is he supposed to do it or not? Should he do it? Well, you see, it, you can't just take the Bible one verse at a time. You know, it's like, um, uh, you know, for so many times in my life, uh, because I have effeminate characteristics about me, you know, people would quote, the uh, first Corinthians uh, to me, the letter of Paul to the Corinthians um, that says that those who are effeminate will not enter the uh, kingdom of heaven. Oh yeah, absolutely. They'd say, those who are effeminate will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And because supposedly people say, you know, that I have effeminate characteristics about me, that means, you know, I'm not going to heaven. In fact, you know, when I was in the seminary, there were certain professors and people who would say that. You can't be a priest! Banned! 
because of certain things about you. Oh yeah, we are very good at excluding people, aren't we? Very good at throwing people out. I will never forget this young man who came to see me when I was in Las Vegas. He was 26 years old. And when he was 17 in his church, he showed up to the choir because he was a member of the choir and he showed up dressed like a, like a woman because people go through all sorts of crises in their life. You know, I mean, people's lives are very, very hard. And he showed up dressed like a woman. And the priest came up to him and said, you don't belong here. We don't want you here. And they threw him out of the church. And he said to me, Father, you know, they threw me out of the church. And when I was thrown out of the church, I ended up going to bars and clubs and getting into all sorts of horrible things. He even contracted HIV because we threw him out. We, I mean the church, we threw him out from a community into the world. That's what we do. We exclude. God includes. We pick and choose from the Bible like the devil. You know, remember the devil quoted scripture at Jesus too. The devil is great at quoting scripture. The devil knows the Bible better than you. Anybody can quote the Bible. You see, many people know the book, but I know the author. I want you to get to know the author of the book. It's not about the book. God is love. The Bible was written by human beings. It wasn't written by God. And these human beings had their own misconceptions and they came at writing these inspired things with their own backgrounds and their own biases. The Bible permits, for example, slavery. Did you know that? St. Paul in the New Testament says, uh, slaves obey your masters. How many of you think we should have slaves today? You, you approve slavery? Do you approve slavery? Well, the Bible does. The Bible says there's nothing wrong with it. What's wrong with so many people? Stop quoting one verse after another. We have to take the Bible in totality. In totality. We don't take the Bible literally. We take the Bible seriously, but not literally. It was a document that was written 2,000 or 3,000 years ago, some of the books, and we have to look at them with the perspective of the eyes of that time. I believe in a God who doesn't include exclude anybody, a God who is inclusive. Stop throwing people out. This eunuch, a foreigner, the Bible clearly bans him, He's castrated. He should not be included. He should not be baptized. And Philip, in chapter 8 of the book of Acts, baptizes him. He baptizes him. And I'm Philip, you know. I'm Philip. I've baptized so many people that should not, according to the rules, have been baptized. <laughs> I mean, if I, I can't tell you all, of course I can't because, you know, this is being recorded. <laughs> I can't tell you, but, you know, because I do not believe in a God that excludes. The eunuch says, I want to be baptized, and that is enough. That is enough. Let me quote to you Isaiah 56 Three, because you have this, you, you see, in the Bible, it's like, okay, uh, you can't take one thing out, one, one part out. So Deuteronomy 23.1 bans eunuchs. 
But Isaiah 56.3 includes eunuchs. Listen to this. Isaiah 56, starting at verse 3. Do not let the foreigner, okay, be excluded. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. The eunuch is a foreigner. You get it? God says, the Lord will surely not exclude him from his people. And listen to this. And let no eunuch complain. I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple as its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. You see? God wants eunuchs. You get it? God wants everybody. God wants those who are divorced. God wants all those people on the margins. The more marginalized you are, the more pleasing to the Lord you are, the more God wants you. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants and who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, altar. for my house. Listen to this right now. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Now, nations doesn't mean, you know, like countries. Nations means just all people. For my house will be a house of prayer for all people. That's the God I believe in. Do you understand that? A God for everybody. The sovereign Lord declares, He who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. It's what Jesus says. I have others. I have other sheep who are not of this fold. These also I must lead. And there will be one shepherd. One shepherd. Let me tell you about my grandmother. Do you know that I give you the faith of my grandmother? I'm not giving you some sophisticated theological seminary faith, you know, all of that. Okay, no. It's my grandmother's faith. She is the best Bible I have ever read in my life. And my grandmother cannot read the Bible. So all these people who say, people need to read the Bible. Well, how can my grandmother read the Bible? She can't. Okay? She can't but she's the best Bible I have ever read. You know that I have family members who are Muslim because I have cousins and, and others who have moved out of Poland and they've moved to other countries of the European Union and they have married Muslims. And I have family members who are so-called very sophisticated, you know, who've gone to universities who exclude these members of my family. They want nothing to do with these Muslim members of my family because they are of a different religion. They profess Islam and also because they are black. I have racist family members. Mm -hmm. it's, it saddens me very much. Makes me very sad. Family members who are educated in universities, who have a lot of degrees, they go to church every week, and yet they do not love everybody and see God in everybody. And my grandmother, when she was told that she had Muslims in her family, she looks at 
me and she says, I said, Grandma, you know, uh, they are Muslims. And she says, I don't know what that is. I said, well, it's a different religion. And she says, yeah, and? I don't know what that is, she says, but I do know one thing, she said. There is only one God, and he is God of all. And he is God of all. There is only one God, and he loves each and every one of us equally. God loves each and every one of us equally. What more do you need to know? God loves each and every person. The man in the chariot in chapter 8 of the book of Acts represents exactly what Isaiah refers to here, the eunuch. He is a foreigner and he is a excluded class. And Isaiah is looking forward to the day. What day? The day of the Lord, the day of Jesus. When people like that are not excluded anymore, when anyone who loves God and when anyone who seeks to honor God is included. And so as the chariot goes along, the eunuch sees water and says, I want to be baptized. I want to belong. And Philip says, okay, let's baptize you. And Philip baptizes the eunuch. Isn't that how we all should be in our own life? Not to exclude, but to include every single person? That's the church that I want to belong to. And that's the church that I invite you to as well. You know, read 1 Corinthians 6.9. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says that those who are effeminate, those who have effeminate characteristics will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That is a charge that is leveled at me and at others. You could just read some of the comments and, and things that people post about me, that people say. And it's very hurtful, very hurtful, very hurtful because it's coming from people who say that they love God and that they are religious. Be careful with the religious people. Religion killed Jesus. It was religious people, the Pharisees and the scribes, who killed Jesus, the Sanhedrin. They killed Jesus. The word religion comes from the Latin Religare, which means to enslave. How many people are slaves of religion? Quoting this scripture or that scripture. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 refers to one set of people without understanding the context of what it is talking about that I will explain at some other time to all of you. God does not exclude anybody and neither should you. I will never forget my grandmother uh, around the time of uh, the harvest, when my grandfather brought the freshly milled wheat from the harvest to uh, to the house, and then they took it and made uh, flour out of it. And she formed bread, and she was baking the bread in the oven and me and my brother were waiting in order to 
eat this bread that was coming out of the oven, fresh bread. And she takes it out of the oven. She takes it out of the oven and we're thinking that she's going to let us eat it. And she takes it out, makes a cross on it, wraps it up. And she says, here, take it to the neighbors because they are poorer than we are. They do not have as much as we have. Take it to the neighbors because they have a lot of kids there. They have a lot of kids. Take it to them. Because bread is meant to be shared, not meant to be hoarded. I ask myself, Grandma, what university did you learn all of this in? She's never been to school, never went to college, never went to any university. She doesn't know how to read or write. And yet, she is a human being full of love. And that's what she's taught me. That's what she's taught me, to love each and every person. Not to exclude, but to always include every single person. To follow the Jesus who gave everything for us, including his life. And that's what I'm calling each and every one of you to do as well. Don't pay attention to people who take the Bible out of context, who quote verses of the Bible to exclude and to hurt people, to send a young boy to hell like they just did. That's why I had to take that post down. It's very hurtful. Or those who quote like 1 Corinthians 6, 9 at me saying that I'm going to go to hell because Supposedly, they say that I have effeminate characteristics. You know, like, it's very hurtful. And these are all religious people. People who say that they love God. They love their own idea of God. The God that they have created for themselves. It's easy to say, oh, I love God out there. I love God. No, when he's out there. But it's another thing to love God in each and every person, especially the person who is different, who isn't like me. But that's what we have to do. Love each and every person. Love the hell out of each and every person. This uh, one preacher Elmer Scott, and I posted a video in Spanish. Uh, he posted a video and he made such fun of me. And he made fun of um, the, the Catholic faith, you know, the, the fact that I'm into statues because there's all these uh, uh, right, rigid Christians, you know, evangelicals and others you know, who criticize us as Catholics for, use, for having statues. Uh, and they don't respect, you know, they think that their thing is the, the, the best, of course, and, you know, that we're going to hell, of course, and that, you know, they're, they're correct. Uh, <laughs> and he really made fun of me in this video, like, unreal and made fun of our Catholic faith, uh, disparaging our Catholic faith. The video is there on, the, on Facebook. If you speak Spanish, you should watch it. It's horrible. You know, he's laughing and everything else. And, and I contacted him. And I didn't get into any debates, but I just sent him well wishes. And I told him that I was praying for him and that, you know, uh, 
I mean, I invite him to my house and then I will make him a good Polish meal with some homemade Polish vodka. Yeah, did you know that? My, my grandma's homemade Polish vodka. She makes vodka. In fact, my grandma and my town in Poland all knows this. She was in jail. Yeah, she went to jail for making vodka under communism. Did you know that? Did I ever tell you this story? Yeah, she went to jail. <laughs> my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> going to jail for making vodka. It's a really, really good vodka. Seriously. Okay. But, um, me, <laughs> it, it, you know, I sell statues and other things. Maybe I should be into selling vodka too. <laughs> Grandma's vodka. <laughs> Na zdrowie. <laughs> but I invited him for a shot of my uh, uh, grandma's vodka. I said, come. And he responded to me. And he even called me father. He said, Father, thank you so much. Because love, love smooths out. Love softens hardened hearts. I always respond with lots and lots of love to every single person, including to the people who hate me, who talk horrible about me. Always respond with lots of love. As Jesus says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Do not respond with a punch to a punch. Turn the other cheek. And, you know, he responded and he said, yeah, you know, why not? <laughs> That's how you respond. Don't get into discussions with people who curse you. Don't respond with hate for hate. Love the hell out of your enemies, as Jesus teaches us. Do what I do. You know, all those people who send me to hell for having effeminate characteristics and because of 1 Corinthians 6, 9, they quote at me and they say, you're going to go to hell because of that. I don't respond to them. I love them and I accept them. They are part of the body of Christ. They are my brothers and sisters. They're not my enemies. They're my brothers and sisters. I love them too. And I pray for them. All the people who send me to hell as well. I love them as well. I'm looking at all your comments, so go ahead and comment. Uh, you, want a you want my grandma's recipe. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> no, I, I'm so happy to be coming to all of you. Go ahead and comment, everybody, if you're uh, getting something out of uh, uh, today's uh, reflection to all of you. Uh, uh, yeah, later on at 12, I'm going to uh, also uh, do a transmission in Spanish as well. So don't worry. <laughs> but my grandmother is the best example of love in my life. You know, I will never forget. You all know that um, my parents are divorced. You know that, right? I've told you this before. And it's very hard, very hard. Um, and when I was uh, being ordained, it's, this is a hard story for me to share, but when I was um, being ordained a priest, the bishop called me and said, we're going to an, uh, ordain you a priest at such and such a date. And my parents had a horrible divorce. I even had to go to court to testify because they were fighting for child support. It was just terrible. Terrible. And uh, the bishop called me and said, we're going to ordain you on such and such a date. And you know, the first thing I did is I called my mother and I said, the bishop just called. And he said, we're going to ordain you a priest on such and such a day. And you know what the first thing I did? 
I called my mom and I thought that she was going to say, oh, how wonderful that it's finally coming to an end. How wonderful that you're finally reaching the light at the end of the tunnel. But no, my mother said, is your father going to be there? Because if he is, I'm not going. Can you imagine? Of course my mother loves me. It's Mother's Day. And I love her too. But her hate for my father was stronger than her love for me. And the same thing happened when I called my father. Is your mother going to be there? Because if she is, I'm not going. And I told this to the rector of the seminary and he said, don't worry, Adam. He said, we're going to put your mom on one end of the chapel and your dad at the other end of the chapel. Tell them that. Can you imagine how I felt? All the other young men being ordained had their parents together, but mine were at one end, one on one end and one at the other. And I prayed, I, I prayed for years for God to soften their hearts. I prayed for years. And at the moment of peace, when the bishop said, share with one another a sign of peace, the miracle happened that I was praying for. My father left his side of the chapel and went over to my mother's side. And I saw him extend a hand to her and say, peace be with you. The miracle happened. And I asked them after, don't you feel better? Don't you feel better now? Love softens hearts. And I pray that for each and every one of you in your own families, that you may experience that softening of your own heart and the heart of your families, your loved ones, your children. It was a powerful moment in my own life, a moment of forgiveness when the love of God was flowing there. Oh, somebody was there. They're saying that they were there. Yeah, because a lot of people saw that. The, the moment when my father left his side of the chapel. It was very powerful. Lots of people saw that. Because he had to walk right all the way across the cathedral. All the way across in order to. Lots of people saw it that day. Somebody was commenting that they saw it. They were there. It's actually on video when he did that after years and years. So what is it that you're praying for in your own life? You know, I prayed for 10 years for that. It was 10 years of my prayers. My parents not talking to each other, hating each other. And God touched their hearts and softened their hearts of stone. What is it that you're praying for in your own life? Place your prayers here, comment them, because I'm going to be praying for all of you, as I always do, for you to experience that same miracle. I've experienced so many miracles with the love of God. 
And I pray for each and every one of you. That's why I want you to comment and place your prayers here. What is it that you need me to pray for? And share this reflection this morning so that more people can be nourished by the love of God in their own life. Live by forgiveness. Acceptance. To accept each and every person. Not to ever exclude, but to always include everybody. You all know that you live in my heart and do not pay rent. You know that, right? Each and every one of you, you live in my heart and you do not pay rent. Did you know that? And I pray for each and every one of you. Did you know that? And I pray for your loved ones. All those who need prayers. So go ahead and comment with all of your prayer intentions. And it's God who chooses us. Not we who choose God. Remember that. God is after each and every one of your loved ones. Your job is to make sure that they are connected to you. So many of you are worried about your family and friends, your grandkids. Where? What's going to happen to them? They don't go to church anymore. They don't pray. They say they're atheists. You are the body of Christ. You are Jesus in their life. Jesus has no other body than yours. As long as they are connected to you, and if you are judgmental, if you keep saying, oh, you need to go to church, you need to pray, you need to do this, you need to do that, they're not going to want to be connected to you. And if they get disconnected from you, they get disconnected from Jesus, and they get disconnected from the church because you are the church. So my job is to make sure that everybody is connected to me. And if I become this priest who is harsh, rigid, all about rules and regulations, who's going to want to who's going to want to join? Come on. Why is it that so many people are attracted to me, to my um, vision of the church and of faith? Because I love each and every body, each and every person. And because I accept each and every person. And because I'm not, oh, oh no, 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 no. do this, do this, do this. Why? Because my job is to make sure that people are connected, that they are connected to me. Because as long as they are connected to me, they are connected to the church. So your grandkids that don't go to church, your kids that don't go to church, as long as they are connected to you, they are connected to God. Do you understand that? And they will be okay. Keep them connected to you. Stop yapping. Talk less to your children about God and more to God about your children. Or you think you're so powerful that your words are going to somehow convert somebody. God is all powerful. God converts. God touches people. Our job is to love and to accept and to walk with people as God walks with us. We are to walk with one another as God walks with us. Remember, God is Emmanuel we are told, God with us, God with us, not the God who fixes everything for us, but the God who is with us. And if God is with us, everything is going to be okay. I will never forget when I was in Crescent City and these big storms would happen because it's a coastal town in California. Huge storms would happen. And 
I was visiting a family once and everybody was scared. Oh, what's gonna happen? These winds. You know, they were rocking the house and everybody was scared except this little boy. He was like six or seven years old and he was playing as if nothing. And I asked him, aren't you scared? And he says, no, I'm not scared. And I said, why? And he says, because my daddy is home. My daddy is home. How can I be scared if my daddy is home? Is your daddy home? Is your daddy home? I'm asking you a question right now. We say, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof when we go to mass. What's that roof? Our, our hearts, our soul. God is in me and with me. And if God is with me, everything is going to be okay. Do you understand that? I visit so many people who are in uh, distressed situations. Distressed situations. I will never forget when I was a deacon in Michigan. I went to seminary in Michigan, in Detroit, Michigan, and I was a deacon in a church before I was ordained a priest. And I was called to visit this family who was experiencing a huge tragedy. There was a huge snowstorm. You know, I went from snowstorms to like hurricane storms in California. So I've experienced it all. So when somebody tells you, Father Adam hasn't seen it all, listen, I've seen it all. You know, sometimes people come in confession and they're like, oh, Father, I don't know how to tell you this. I'm going to shock you. Listen, okay, I've heard it all. I've seen it all. <laughs> And so there was this huge snowstorm one day and this father left the house to go to work but didn't make it to work. And he came back and he, instead of going inside the house, he went to uh, shovel the snow and he didn't realize that his four-year-old son had left the house. And he went into his truck, his four by four truck, a big truck. And he put it in reverse and he crushed his son. He crushed his son. He killed his own son instantly. He said he could just feel the bones cracking as he put the car in reverse. And I was called into this distressed situation. And I walk in and there's, the, can you imagine what I walked into? And the mother of the little boy, she comes and she grabs me by my shoulders. And she says, Father, how could, how could God allow this? How, why did this happen? And she kept asking me, why? Why did God let this happen? Why? Why? And I looked at her and I didn't know what to do. And I mean, I, I, I didn't know what to say. I mean, what do you say in a situation like this? What do you say? What can you say? And I looked at her and I said, I don't know what to say. And I began to cry as well. I don't know what to say. I don't know. And at that, the grandmother comes and says, it's okay, Father. It's okay, Father Adam. All that matters is that you are here with us. All that matters is that you're here. All that matters is that you're here. That's God. God is with us. If I visit somebody in the hospital, I don't go through these lengthy prayers or something, you know, because at the end, what will the people say? Father Adam visited me. He came to see me. That's our God. He's with us. God is with you in whatever distressed situation you find yourself in. You are not alone. Everything is going to be okay. Read Psalm 23. Even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, you're not stuck. 
You are not stuck. You are walking. And that means you are going to get out. Do you get it? Everything is going to be just fine. God is with you. And you know how I know that God is with you? Because I am with you. Yes. Mwah. I am with you. You are not by yourself. Say hello to me. Say hello. You are not by yourself. Everything is going to be just fine. You will be just fine. All will be well in your life. Let me give you all a blessing for today. As I bless you today and always. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mwah. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Say hello. And make sure you're uh, sharing the Bible, uh, the reflection today. I was going to say Bible study, but it's Sunday morning. So wonderful to be with all of you. Thank you so much. We had some uh, difficulty in transmitting the Mass, so I'm with you all uh, like this, uh, sharing with you the Gospel reflection for uh, this morning. I hope that uh, you found some nutrition in it. Please uh, comment and tell me if this was helpful or not for you, for you, as I do prepare and I want you to be touched in your life by the love of God, because we all need the love of God. We don't need rules and regulations. You know what I mean? Everybody knows the rules and regulations, but we need love. That's the fuel for living. We're missing, we're missing love. The rules and regulations we keep after we get touched by God in our life, don't we? Yeah, first we have to feel that God loves us, that we are okay, that there's nothing wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with you. You know, all those people who keep telling me that there's something wrong with me, I feel bad for them. I really do, and I pray for them. Absolutely. Because they don't know how much they, they hurt me. And if they, if they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't do it. So I pray for them as I pray for uh, each and every one of you always. Have a beautiful, beautiful Sunday. Keep smiling always. I love you all. Mwah. Keep commenting. I'm going to be reading all of the comments, your prayers, and share the Bible study, okay? Have a beautiful morning. Mwah. Say hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Do you like this hello, hello? <laughs>